Favourite Parrot's first novel, Past the Shallows, was published in 2011. It was critically acclaimed and shortlisted for the Miles Franklin Award and won the Dobby Literary Award. And she was also the ABIA Newcomer of the Year in 2012. Favel has also published short stories in a number of journals, including Ireland and Griffith Review, and has now published her second novel, When the Night Comes, which is shortlisted in the fiction category of the Indie Awards and was a Booktopia Book of the Year in 2014. Um, I'm sure you know the format of our events. We're going to discuss Fable's novel. She'll give a couple of short readings from the novel uh, during the course of our hour together. Um, we'll be sure to leave time for your questions, and afterwards there'll be signed book signing over on the opposite side of the site, um, outside the book tent. But would you please, first of all, join me in welcoming Fable Parrot. Thank you. I mean, this is a fascinating story um, to do with many things, not least Antarctica. I guess, can you tell us, was there any particular image, idea, event that made you start on this work? There absolutely was, but firstly, I'm just going to ask, um, hands up if you remember the ship Nelladan. Lots of hands, that's fantastic. I always ask that question and there's never been no hands raised at any event so far. So this ship, I knew this ship when I was a kid in Hobart and, and most kids did and I was obsessed with Antarctica and the big icebreakers that used to go there. And I had some photographs of Nella Dan that used to live on my wall but I totally forgot about them for 30 years and I was cleaning well, not quite 30, almost. I was cleaning up and um, found these black and white photos of this beautiful red ship that I used to know. And so much stuff came flooding back and I sat down and started writing that day. However, I never imagined it would be a novel. I thought it would just be for me because I wanted to know everything about the ship. Um, and go on a sort of research adventure just for myself. Luckily for me, it did turn into a novel once I had some characters and snippets of storyline coming through. Yeah. You say that, you mentioned that uh, when you were growing up in Hobart that the, the ships had a presence. Can you, I mean, were they an important part of life there? Were, were things that people talked about that were very visible? They're absolutely visible. If anyone's been to Hobart, um, you might see now the bright orange ship, Aurora Australis, in the harbour. And she sits there for half the year um, when she's not working the summer, going down to Antarctica. So she's a big presence in Hobart. Everyone knows her. It's this big, bright thing in a sort of grey city. And Nella Dan was, was like that for me, a big red ship in a grey city, in a cold, grey city so she was the brightest thing in Hobart for me and I would always look for her is she in is she where is she is she sailing to Casey or Mawson or Macquarie Island or is she heading back to Denmark you'd see her coming up the Derwent and it would be very exciting knowing that she was back yeah, yeah. and with the, the, the crew did they were they sort of visible like when they came on, on to land and so on was that were you they conscious were, of them they were very visible things are a little bit different now but back in the 80s, um, the crews of these ship, ships would um, have time off in Hobart. So it was a, a beautiful time for them to rest and walk and go and eat Chinese food or pizza, go and see bands. Many of these Danish sailors had good friends in Hobart. Um, so it was a nice time for them to go to people's houses, to use the phone and call home rather than a phone box. Um, many of the Danish sailors that I spoke to said Hobart was their home away from home, their second home, and they loved it. Um, so it was a real joyous time for them, and you knew when the, the Danes were in town. It seemed like Hobart was a bit more lively. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, yeah. you're gradually sort of, these, these memories are coming back, I take it, as, as, you're, as you're noting things down and, and writing sections. This is coming back to you? Ha half of the book was memory and the other half was the stories that strangers told me so I had yes. so much help with this book 
the research took me on amazing journeys. I met with so many Danish sailors that had worked on Nella, who I had never met as a child, but took me into their home in Denmark, at their homes, took me sailing, fed me food, gave me heaps of Danish beer. Um, <laughs> We cried, usually after quite a few beers, about <laughs> Nella Dan. But I now have friends all over Denmark, and it's, it was incredible, this generosity and this love and the stories. So some of it was from memory and some of it was new things that I learned, other people's memories that they generously shared with me. I had expeditioners from Australia, from Perth, from Adelaide, from all over Australia contact me and tell me their stories and what it was like being an Australian on board Nella and how much love there was for Nella from the Australian expeditioners and from the army larkies, the guys that used to um, offload all the cargo. So much love for this ship, yeah. so many stories. Yeah. Yeah. I could have kept researching probably for... 20 really? years. Yeah. <laughs> now, you, you mentioned to me earlier, you got this amazing sort of scholarship to travel to Antarctica. This sounds like the most extraordinary gig. Can you just tell us about this? Yeah, and forgive me if I've already mentioned this many times, but it's such a great opportunity for artists. Every year, the um, Antarctic Division has an arts fellowship It's March 15th, so it's really soon if you want to get in this year. But, um, the prize isn't money, but it's a chance to go either by a ship or by plane to one of the bases and see how they work, to go to a working base on a working ship, something that money can't buy. Yeah. Um, so for me, it was so perfect for my book to be able to be a sailor for a month and see what it's like to work on a polar vessel, to be my character, to be this Danish man who works in the galley. Yeah. I was with him the whole time I was on the ship. But I also was living out a dream that I had when I was that kid in Hobart. I got to be a sailor for a month. Yeah. I got to look down that road and I knew it would have been good. It yeah. would have fitted me. I don't get seasick. I just would wake up every day so excited and I sleep like a baby at sea. I just, I always have at sea, but this trip, it was pretty rough and I was probably one of the only people who would just like <laughs> go to sleep and wake up I, I, when I, my alarm went off. So um, I was lucky. Yeah, I envy. I mean, I get seasick just thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. just, just, you know, just, you know, just, but, but I mean, this isn't exactly a writer in residence gig, is it? I mean, you're actually doing real labor. This is hard I, work. Yeah, I, um, I really hassled the crew out. The, the beautiful P&O crew of Aurora Australis were so patient with me and they thought I was insane because I every day would say I want to do work I'll do anything I'll do anything anything and um eventually the captain said sure you can mop the decks from 4 30 in the morning for five hours and then come and see me so I would do these tasks and have a smile on my face and come back for more and when they realized I was serious they really started to show me what it really was like to work on a ship so I got paired up with different um, crew members each day and I would work alongside them as well as continuing to do the dishes and mop <laughs> the decks but I even did time in the engine room which was really probably a little bit terrifying actually it's three stories down below the waterline and it's about 55 degrees and if you can imagine uh, 300 car engines running at once with the hot air coming out of them, that's what it's like in the engine room, which is actually three stories. And we had once an emergency drill in the engine room. The lights went off, a red siren went, and we had to climb up this ladder, three stories, single file. And if you didn't make it in 30 seconds, the engine room was shut off and it's to stop fires from destroying the whole ship and even though it was just a drill that was probably the only time I've ever been scared at sea being under the water in the dark climbing up a ladder blind hoping that I made it out um, 
and I didn't. <laughs> I was very <laughs> slow. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just a drill. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, I mean this, it seems to me, I mean, this experience has really paid off. I mean, there's fantastic detail in the novel of the, their lives on, on board the ship. I and mean, it's, it's really fantastic stuff. Um, mm. Now, we talk a little about the character. There are two principal characters, I would suggest. There's Isla, the young girl mm -hmm. in Hobart, and Bo, the, the seaman, the Danish seaman. Can you just tell us a little about Isla first and her background and how she's come to be in Hobart? Yeah, Isla started from memories of that I have of Hobart in the 80s. I tried not to go back there now and, and, and research. I did a little bit, but Hobart has changed. So I tried to remember what was it like to walk around Battery Point in the 1980s to get myself to school? What was it like when it was raining? What was it like on a Sunday when it was a dead town and there was no one and nothing open? What was it like to get the ferry to school? So it brought back so many memories. Um, so many things I'd forgotten about. And I talked to my brother a lot too about what he remembered about Hobart. And I'd every day in my mind walk around the streets of West Hobart and Battery Point as that child. Um, but Isla is fiction. She, she, those memories turn into something yeah. real real a character of, of of her own with her own thoughts and feelings and surprising actions um i i didn't mean to write about hobart it's a place that i didn't want to spend all of my days in the cold and the rain and the gray streets but it it, it kept coming through it kept coming back um this town that I grew up in. Yeah. I, I believe you have a sort of, personally, you have a sort of a slight love-hate relationship with Hobart these days. Yeah, I, I, I lo Hobart's so beautiful, it, uh, but there's an aspect to it that's dark for me. So there's a kind of sadness there that I felt as a child that it, I believe is still there and it's from the past and from lots of things. Um, there's also joy in life and it's beautiful, but it is the end of the earth in a way. It's this island at the bottom of the world and it does feel like that. I used to have nightmares when I was a teenager that um, the government, the Australian government had decide to, decided to annex Tasmania and have border controls and you had 24 hours to, to get it out or you would be stuck. And I'd be in this panic, <laughs> I've got to get to the mainland. <laughs> <laughs> I, had a similar, I was in New Zealand last year for the first time, and again, which I, which I loved, but there is a feeling of being at the end of the world, of being right at the end of the world. This is Sure, and that can also bring amazing things. Like, I love the Southern Ocean, and that's where it starts for me. The bottom of Tasmania is where it really starts, that really wild ocean yeah. that is untamable, but also incredible. Yeah. Um, I'm probably one of the only people that gets really excited when the swell gets really big on a ship. So as long as I, like, I mean, breaking over the bow big, um, I love it, that feeling, there's this, if you stand on the bridge, you're going down this, this steep mountain, but another one's coming, moving towards you at an equal speed of the ship, but then you start going up and there's this moment at the top when you're completely weightless and it's, oh, it's like, um, it's elation for me. I, I would be on the bridge just going, whoo! <laughs> and while the poor crew were like quite stressed <laughs> steering the ship <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, so Isla and her brother and mother they now they're relatively new arrivals in Hobart aren't they they've come from mainland Australia yeah. they are they arrive um, in the night by ship mm. across that treacherous bit of water the Bass Strait um, yeah, and, and these kids, to them, it's a very new place, an unknown place, and a, sc a scary place. Mm. Um, very different than where they're from. And they're trying to find their way in this new town that they feel is full of ghosts. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely how I felt. 
when I was a kid, ask anyone from Hobart if they've got a ghost story from when they were young and they were, I guarantee you they will. <laughs> <laughs> now, could you tell us a little about Isla's first encounter with Bo? Sure, well, would you like me yeah, to read yeah, this bit actually? Yeah, let's do that, yeah. Okay, so this is when Isla first sees this ship, Nella Dan. It's called There Was a Man. The rain came down. I had my japara on, the hood covering my head and my hands tucked up inside. It was too big for me, the japara, but still the heavy black material kept most of the rain out. My brother was sick at home. He'd been coughing in the night and was probably on the couch under his doona watching TV, waiting for mum to get up. It was really cold in that old house in Battery Point and there was no heater. I didn't want to go to school. I thought about not going and going home to look after my brother, but I didn't. I just kept standing there in the rain, waiting for the ferry. It must have been really early. There was no one else at the jetty. I could see the air when I breathed and everything was water. I looked down, watched the rain fall on the slick black surface of the river. The drops formed perfect circles that got bigger and bigger until I could no longer follow the whole circle at once. Time and space. The raindrops were separate. They fell in a kind of silence. But then the rain got harder, suddenly bursting, and there were too many drops to follow. The whole surface of the water prickled up and became rough and jumbled. The stillness gone. The rain smacked my japara hard and it sounded like being inside a tent. I turned so that the rain couldn't hit my face. I looked down at my feet, my wet sneakers. I closed my eyes and listened to the rain, listened to it fall on my hood. I imagined that the ferry was coming, that it was heading this way, pushing the water forward, pushing in against the wooden jetty. When I opened my eyes, the ferry would be here and the Captain Peter would run down from the wheelhouse to throw the thick rope around the wooden pylon and then he would help us all on, one by one. I would go inside and get dry, I could get warm. I counted 20 drops of rain on my hood, then another 20 and another. I kept my eyes closed. I counted 40 more for good luck. Then I opened my eyes. Red, nothing but red, a bright red wall of steel. A ship, as tall as a building, as big as the sky. And when I looked up, there was a man standing against the rail. He was tall, dressed in white, and he was waving. I turned around, but there was no one there behind me. There was only me, me standing on the little jetty opposite this giant ship, the hood of my japara covering, covering half of my face. And I knew that the man could not see my eyes, my hair. He waved again like he knew me. He waved, someone could see me. I waved back, my hand still tucked up in my japara sleeve. We were both standing there in the rain, the black water between us, and I don't know why he was waving, but I waved back. I took notice. A red ship, a red flag f flying in the breeze, a man dressed in white. Then a horn blew and I nearly jumped out of my skin. It was the ferry. <coughs> People came from out of the grey nothing behind me. Men in suits, older kids who caught the ferry to school, but everything was dull compared to the red. They were like fog, these people, blended into the gray rain and concrete. When I looked back up at the ship, the man was gone. A patch of sunlight broke through the clouds, hit the red bow, just a tiny beam. For a second, there was nothing else but the words written clear, white against red, Nella Dan. I said the words over and over in my head, Nella Dan, Nella Dan, Nella Dan. They made my heart beat out faster. Thank you, thank you.
It's a lovely, it's a lovely sequence. It's a beautiful image that she opens and this huge red ship is, is there. And it's, it's one of the things that struck me, you, you achieve so well in the novel, is the, the young person's or the child's point of view. Um, and that one for key sentence where I think you say, somebody noticed me or somebody could, could see, me. see me. Yeah. Could you just talk a little about writing, writing a character from a young person's point of view? It's really difficult. I've never really thought about yeah. it. I, I, this is my second book where I've had characters that are young. It seems really natural to me. And it might be that my writing style is simple. I don't use a lot of big words. I can be with that child part of myself quite easily, yeah. quite happily. Um, I would say it's not something that I would do on purpose. And I think if you're trying to force it, it it's... It won't be right. It's an organic thing. Um, trying to remember what it is like to see things for the first time, to be small, to be someone that no one sees, to have no control over where you move or where you live or what you eat, those things. Small things, but um, I seem to be able to remember <laughs> yeah, yeah yes I, yeah. you're absolutely right. that sort of powerlessness that c lack of control comes comes through very clearly and also there's a sort of a sort of clear-eyed quality to isla i think she just sees things very she sees things very simply very clearly it seems to me i felt like isla is like a barometer for what's going on around her she yeah. is watching everyone yeah. and taking it in Silently, her time will come later, but for now she's observing, watching very closely, yeah. watching people's emotions, watching adults, trying to work out why do adults do the things that they do. Yeah. Um, and I think we forget about that, that, that one, children are forced to live where their parents live, to move when their parents get a new job, to... For good or bad, it's not its not necessarily a trauma, it's just a fact. Yeah. They cannot decide for themselves yet. So they're constantly trying to work out what these adults are doing yeah. and why they're doing it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I find that really interesting. Yes, yeah. And, and uh, she also has a, lo a lot of responsibility, I think, especially for her younger brother. But their mother seems to me, she's at best distracted. And, and you know, she, they're really left to to themselves quite a lot. I thought it was interesting to have um, a parent who was lost. Um, I, I remember when I turned about 15 suddenly realising that my parents were people yeah. that had a past yeah. that I wasn't a part of. They had a whole life, lots yeah. of things had happened to them, heartbreak, joyous times, moving, um, fear, sadness, or all of these things, they were their own person. Yeah. That's an amazing revelation. Um, and I've never forgotten that. So here is this mother who's doing her best, um, but is lost, a ghost. Something's happened to her yeah. and she's not coping that well. Yeah. Um, and so the responsibility falls to Isla to keep her younger brother on track, to get them to school, to get them breakfast, to make sure there's food. Um, and that's a big responsibility. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, a, there's a key scene where, um, without giving too much away, where for once she doesn't chaperone her brother home the, for reasons they go they take separate routes and it's a it's a major trauma for him it's a major yeah it's been such an interesting process because i spoke to my brother a lot about things we'd never spoken about moving to tasmania is something that happened to us and i forgot that he's his own person too and has his own memories and stories that have got nothing to do with me and he told me some things that i never knew about him they're really surprising hot dogs is one and if you read the book you'll know but this obsession with hot dogs when he was young that he would do anything to get a hot dog <laughs> and i just had no idea but the that scene came from a memory of my brother that yeah. where he had never told anyone about that and it came back when we were talking that 
he walked home by himself one day and nearly got into some trouble and yeah. and I won't give anything away but um, he's held that secret for 30 years it's yeah. amazing yeah. yeah could we talk a little about Bo the, mm. the sailor who's who waves to her from the from the deck of the Nella Dan just tell us a little about him so he's a young Danish um, cook who has taken this job on Nelladan for nine months and I was interested in why would a young man take a, a really hard job very far away from home for nine months it's a big thing what 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 was the reason and I'd ask so many of the Danes this question because I was so interested and most of them told me the same story they said, when I was a kid, I never wanted to go to sea. My dad was a sailor and I resented that he was always away. He missed my birthdays, he missed Christmas, he missed everything. We'd get these calls from him, you know, somewhere else in the world and I hardly knew him. But then at 16, 17, something inside me shifted and I followed him to sea, that I follow you thing and it was a story that kept coming up so Bo is a man who's trying to understand his father and he's taken a job on the same ship that his father worked on yeah. and he's going to Antarctica so far away from home to work 14 hour days seven days a week for nine months which is what they did and it's hard work I absolutely know it <laughs> <laughs> it's hard um but he's a kind man and he's quiet and he also observes a yeah. lot. Yes. Um, but he sees these kids and what's missing and tries to make life a little bit brighter for them when he comes into their lives. Yeah. And I, I absolutely love Bo and I, I um, he was on the ship with me all the time talking to me. So I'd be doing the dishes looking at the porthole and realising this is exactly what my character would have done 27 years ago, exactly. Same dishwasher, the same view out the porthole of the Southern Ocean. Every now and again, a little round of ice would go by with an emperor penguin on it or something incredible. And you'd be really like, wow, you're just at work doing your daily tasks in this incredible place. And just on a side note, Sometimes you would, I would wake up to go to the toilet or have a drink of water and you'd open the curtain of your porthole and of course the sun would be up all of the time so it's completely light outside at 2 o'clock in the morning. But you would see the most incredible things and think that you were dreaming. My first iceberg was Christmas Eve at 3am and I just like peered out of the porthole and this giant iceberg just moved past the ship and it was just so surreal to then go back to sleep because you have to get up and work yeah. at 4.30. Yeah. It's a bizarre thing. So yeah. I was with Bo and I got this really close experience with him. Yeah. 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 Is this a good time to read yeah. what yeah, a day well. in the galley is like yeah. for my character Bo? Yeah. So this is out at sea on Nelladan. 4am and even though there are many of us in the galley, we are quiet half sleeping, still separated by the solitude that night brings. It takes time to readjust, but we are focused, busy, one task and then another. Coffee in my crack cup, black and bitter. It pulses through me, fills my empty stomach and my thoughts quicken. My eyes moisten and blink and I'm rising up. I'm coming into the working day, the working day. Leo has been here for hours already baking, the life of a baker. The galley warm with the smell of bread, with the smell of pastries coming out of the oven to be cooled and glazed. He always gives us one if we want, the custard inside still hot. You have to be careful or you will burn the roof of your mouth and then enjoy nothing for the rest of the day. Sweetness in the air and there is sweetness in my belly. I feel the sugar pushing my blood around my body. 
Soon the air will be thick with the smell of bacon frying, black pudding, salt and butter and meat and eggs. We prep for the breakfast rush. We will not eat again until it is over and the cleaning is done. Peel and boil and mash the potatoes ready for the potato cakes. Cut up the grapefruits, open and slice the tin pears. Put out the cereals that the Australians like to eat, cornflakes, sultana bran, muesli with milk. Then the sliced cheeses, the ham, the smoked salmon. 5.30 a.m. already. The seamen are up and their thermoses of coffee have been set out for them. They will have their coffee and then start work. At seven, they will come back in hungry for a cooked breakfast. The mess boys have overslept. They're young, 17, just boys. They fight the heaviness of sleep and lose, heavy bones, the weight of all that growth, needing rest and fighting the morning, always fighting. Eric finally appears, his uniform crumpled and a little stained, his hair sticking up. He does not speak, but leans up in the corner near the ovens, his eyes squinting with the fluoro light. Klaus tells him to go and fix his hair and then get the breakfast room set up and then wake Jonas up for Christ's sake. Eric leaves the galley stomping slowly and reappears in a few minutes with his blonde hair wet from being slicked down with water. Jonas is coming, he says. I smile at him and he smiles back, his awkward front teeth squashed together. He's trying to grow a moustache, but his hair is too fine and he's too young, and it looks like there are crumbs left behind on the top of his lip that you want to wipe away. But he's a good kid, and he works hard, and mostly he does not complain. And every one of us knows exactly what it feels like to be 17 on your first ship, working 14-hour shifts so very far away from home. Thank you. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you very much, Trevor. That's lovely. I, I say you, you've read, you've given two readings from the two different sort of narratives that, that run through the, the novel. Could you just tell us a little more about the structure and how you, how you put that together, those alternate <laughs> sections? Some kind of magic structure, and I'm looking at my publisher right now because she knows how hard it is for me to find structure. I just write from voice and character, and I yeah. have no storyline, and I write out of order. So I end up with hundreds of bits on my floor and all everywhere around and in notebooks and and at many times it feels impossible and that these voices don't go together and it's I have to abandon it, I have to start again, it's not going to work. But my publisher Vanessa keeps trying things with me and we keep moving things around and eventually we'll get a little corner and once I've got one piece of the puzzle set down, it might be the end, it might be the start or the middle, but then I can work it through. So then we had these two voices and they were sort of almost telling parallel stories. Mm. I wrote the end first, the last, the very last bit, there was a man, he told me about the sea. It's the first thing I wrote about this character and then, you know, I wrote bits all over the place. Everybody who knows me and how I work knows that's how I work. And it's very frustrating. And I would love to write in order and know the structure. I think for any writers out there, you'd probably know that structure is one of the hardest things because there are so many ways you can tell the story in a linear way. You could start at the end and, and go backwards through backstory. Yeah. You could start in the middle. Who's telling the story? Yeah. Is it present tense? Is it past tense? Is it first person or third person? There's so many variables and they're all equally valid. Yes. So it's about trying to find what feels right. Yeah. You've got to trust that it's very frustrating <laughs> and it's the hardest part. And that's when you're really, as a writer, in despair because you don't know the answers. Yeah. But also, I, I imagine, uh, attempt to, to build a sort of a, a narrative momentum as well through the, through the novel. I had a skeleton of a structure in that Nella Dan's a real ship, and the season 
the working season for the Antarctic bases is a set time and I had these two seasons so that gave me some kind of loose timeline to at least yeah. work with that was very helpful yeah. um, because as soon as summer finishes by April, May the ships can't get down to past 50, 60 degrees south the ice is too thick yeah. it's impossible yeah so there's a short time, there's yeah. a window there. Um, and Nella Dan would go back to Denmark then and work in Greenland. Yeah. So um, those schedules are all real and you can find them on the internet. They, they exist, they're real. So I had that to work with, yeah. Yeah. which helped. Yeah. I love that phrase you just used there, Nella Dan went to Greenland to work as if it's a person, <laughs> which of course is very much their attitude towards Nella Dan as, as in, in the novel, I think. Uh, oh yeah, ships become real and they're yeah. a she and they're a person, absolutely. And they're all different. The way ships take on water is um, they each have their quirks. Yeah. Aurora Australis has her quirks, definitely. And she would, um, in pack ice, really vibrate. So she would hit thick ice and just start humming you could feel it all through your whole body just like sh this shaking this revving up like um like a sort of three-year-old boy who's about who's been you know stuck inside for too many hours he's about to go crazy so um then she just ran ran the ice and you felt so proud of her she became human because she wasn't perfect she would get stuck we were stuck dead for two days. It's totally normal. Happens every single trip to every single ship that takes on the ice. Yeah. Um, Nella was stuck for seven weeks. That's a little bit too long <laughs> for comfort. Um, but yeah, it, and then when you're stuck, you're stuck and you have to wait for the weather to change. So the ship isn't perfect. It's this, it becomes this a very human, a mother in a way it carries you and it keeps you safe and it keeps you warm the ships are so warm inside it's just so comforting and then the way they rock you to sleep in your bunk under a really warm down doona um somebody's making you food beautiful food you wake up and breakfast's ready and um it's so I loved it. I yeah. absolutely love it. And you pat the ship, and the crew do too. It's a, it's a thing. People would pat bulkhead and say, "Good girl, yeah. good girl." Yeah. You know. Um, and then you get so attached. I really was terribly upset when we got back to Hobart, and I could not stop crying. And as is custom, you all have to go to the pub, of course, because you've been on a dry ship for four weeks. Um, and it was 10 o'clock in the morning and we were all at the pub and I was just like, uh, uh, really upset. And for three days in Hobart, I was completely lost without my this ship. Something had been cut, the umbilical cord had been cut and I felt very alone. Something that, amazing that happens at sea when you're going into dangerous water like the Southern Ocean or Antarctica, you have to trust everyone absolutely straight away. Within an hour of leaving Hobart, you're hugging, everybody's hugging each other. Hello, you trust people. They've got your back. People are, because it is dangerous. You could fall down the stairs, anything could happen to you. So the crew and the expeditions become really close. Um, it's a family, it's really nice. I loved that. That's something I didn't know existed until I went to see. So I was able to use that in the book too. Yeah. Um, there's a real friends for life crew and expeditioners I have made and I feel very lucky and I still keep in touch with so many of them you know some daily it's yeah. a lovely thing yeah there is I mean there's a tremendous sense of family on the ship in the in the novel tremendous sense of that and 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 camaraderie as you say and people the need to be bonded and work well together it's it's life or death I mean, yep. you've got to be very brief and also one understands given her background why this appeals to Ilo it's it's in many ways preferable to her family situation which is not a, not happy 
Yeah, absolutely. It's not lonely. It's not um, isolated. It's working together, a big group of people. There's always someone around to talk to. This girl Isla daydreams that on Nella she would never be lonely and she would never be bored. She would never be all of the things that she is stuck with. Um, and, and like I on the ship, I was you were never lonely, you were never bored. It's not possible. Yeah. Sometimes you know someone slamming a door when you're and waking you up. Little things annoy you, like any family. But what I find really interesting is Isla finds her place later in the book. But you are able as as you grow and mature to find your own family. It doesn't necessarily yes. have to be your blood family. Yes. You find your tribe, your people. It might only be one or two. That's all you need. Yeah. The people who really see you, know you. Um, yeah, and we've all got the ability to find that, and that's yeah. something I think kids don't know yet, and then they learn. Yeah. Um, and it's a great gift yeah. to be able to find your tribe. Yeah. I think there's a, I get a sense that Isla and Bo, they were sort of kindred spirits in a sense, I think. Even though there's an element of recognition between them. Absolutely, they see each other. They're, they're a tribe, yeah. totally different ages, but he recognises something in her. It, it's his childhood too. He, he, see, he knows exactly how she feels. He has empathy, not yeah. just sympathy. So um, he can carry her a little bit. Yeah, yeah. 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 And one, can, one can totally understand why being at sea becomes addictive as well. People want to return again and again and again, you know, because of that closeness. You can't replicate it in I, other situations. Y- yeah, you talk to the crew and by six weeks at sea, they're really ready to go home. But then at home, they're really ready to go back at sea. So they're, it's hard life because you miss home or you miss the sea and the ship and your friends. So you're always missing something. There's one place on the ship that was a little bit sad and it's a cupboard with a phone, a satellite phone that you can use any time. And it's called the cupboard of sorrow. Um, because there would be times when people desperately miss their wives and husband and children and, and parents. Things would happen. People die at home or become sick and these sailors are stuck. They can't get home. There's not an air base. You can't get a helicopter. You are stuck weeks from home. So t- ringing home is one of those times probably where people did feel a bit sad, but then they could always go out and see, go into the galley and get a pastry mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. sit and talk mm-hmm. with the crew. Um, there's a lot of, um, when people are missing wives and family, there's a lot of help there. People really rally around and birthdays are always a big deal. Anniversaries, people's anniversaries, people make a big deal. Um, it's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the other things you mentioned earlier was your own anecdote about looking out the porthole and it's, of course it's light at 2 a.m. in the sun. And there's fantastic vivid descriptions in the book the light the the, the brightness of the light other colors and and coffee they it's, it, there's so much coffee in this book you know it's <laughs> coffee 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 the, the smell of it the taste you know talk about those the senses the sensual well, firstly, side firstly um Nella Dan's the first time i ever smelt real coffee so in the 80s hobart just had instant so i had no idea what this smell was that was so intoxicating and made my head spin. And the Danes were horrified that, you know, people in Tasmania drank instant coffee. They were like, please. Um, So that's something that I remember. But on the ship, coffee's really important. So you have these really long shifts. It's quite cold when you're outside, but then warm inside. But coffee's this big thing. And on the trip before my trip, they did get beset in the ice for three weeks and they had a ship full of science students who were drinking five or six coffees a day and they actually ran out 
and there was a real problem. <laughs> Only the master and the first mate had a secret stash because they actually were very important and they need to stay awake. But people were coming off coffee and having terrible <laughs> reactions and tea wasn't cutting it. And it's the first time ever that Aurora's ran out of coffee and the galley staff could not believe how much coffee these students had drunk. But it becomes very important coffee. Yeah. Yeah. to keep you alert, awake, it's dangerous. Yeah. Things you forget, you start becoming very comfortable at sea and running up and down the stairs. And all it takes is one tiny little jolt and you are just very badly injured, possibly dead. And you forget one hand for the ship, one hand for you. So it's one hand on the bulkhead and one hand for you ready to, if you fall. And you forget coffee keeps you alert keeps you mindful of those things um if you fall over on the deck outside your skin can freeze to the middle and it happens it's happened to people and so you've got to be very careful mindful we step how you, so coffee keeps people alert <laughs> um well i forgot the start of the question coffee what was the other bit? vividness colors vividness, the brightness, colors the light. yeah i never would have known about the colors how many different dimensions there is to ice it's white but it's also silver and it's also all of these shades of blue at once as the light changes um, you get these incredible pinks in the sky and greys. One colour that's missing from Antarctica absolutely is green. So it's really interesting. People who have been on the base for a long time start talking about trees and green and what will it be like to see grass. Um, you really don't know what's missing until you s are approaching Tasmania and you just see this green hue and it's trees. And that feels like home then. Then you go, oh, I've missed green. Yeah. But there are all these colours. The light is strange because it's relentless. It just goes around the horizon. It doesn't go up or down. It's very strange. So you lose all sense of time. And you can get sunburned at 3 o'clock in the morning if you're on night shift, um, which happened to me. You forget. You think it's 3 a.m. I'm not going to need sunscreen. But, yeah. yeah. Um, it's quite bizarre, yeah, yeah. but incredible. Yeah. 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 Um, we take some questions, yeah? I would love yeah. that, if anyone has any. Yeah. Thank you very much for your book, and you've already spoken a bit about this, but I wonder if you'd elaborate on the sense of compassion and positivity between your characters. Yeah, it's a, it's a really great question, and it's a key. That, that sense of compassion, when I was talking about empathy, being able to really see someone and you can't fix Bo can't fix everything for Isla this child but what he can give her is some comforts food pancakes he shows her how to make pancakes he makes pancakes for her he teaches her how to feed a bird out of out of her hand through being still he talks about his home about um, the light, about the water, about his rowboat, sharing stories of his childhood, and that's this um, rope for her to hold on to. Um, it's something for her to grab. It's an adult saying to a child, sometimes things are hard, but that on the other side of this, when you're old enough, you will go anywhere, do anything, be amazing. You just have to get through this time. And here's some small gifts to help you get through. Um, I really love that aspect of him and I think that's why I love Bo so much, his kindness. Mm -hmm. And the way he can see these kids, um, whereas lots of adults would overlook them. He really can see, especially Isla, and they have a close bond and for her I think it's um, really important to have a man that's gentle and kind in her life and that's changing something for her and how she'll be in the future and how she'll see men and that's really important for her. Thank, Thank you, you for that question. 
Hi, um, you talk so passionately about your um, subject and your characters and the process of writing. How do you deal with sort of coming down from all of that once it's finished and, um, <laughs> yeah, just how do you get back to a normal life once you, you're through with all of that? It's, it's really difficult to let go um, of the characters and I think this is where you really need a, a good publisher and editor to say, I think it's done now, I think you need to stop because I could have kept doing the research forever um, and kept writing about Bo forever too. Um, you don't want to give them up, they've just been three of you in a room for two years and they're your imaginary friends. Um, letting go is hard but then the book comes back to you because people have read it and they talk to you about it. Um, downtime, I, I've been trying to make myself just read. I think what's important, when I was writing this book I was really obsessed with it and I couldn't read a lot of fiction. I was reading a lot of non-fiction, Antarctic stuff. And I forgot how much I love fiction and how much it helps writers to um, fill up again creatively. So this summer I've been making myself read. So I've just been having afternoons of what I call summer of fave. I call myself fave. Um, which is I'm allowed to read as much as I want in the backyard with the dogs and um, just enjoy that and have no time. So that's been helping me let go of this and come back into the world of other ideas. But yeah, it is hard. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, Fable. Hi, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> um, I must admit I haven't read the second book yet because um, Past the Shallows was so incredibly addictive that um, I kind of hang on to books when I know there's no more from the author. <laughs> so I'm still holding on to it. But I wanted to, you know how you described as a child, there was this obsession with Antarctica and, and that. What was that feeling like when you got there? What was, what, you know, you, you were there and did you have that Neil Armstrong moment, you stepped out there? Um, <laughs> getting to the continent was great, but for me it was the journey. So the first time I had that feeling, I was so scared leaving. I'm going off with 50 strangers and I'm stuck and I can't get home. And so you're on the, the wharf of Hobart, ready to go up that gangplank and that's it, going. And I was freaking out and I probably rang, you know, my brother and all my friends and I was like, I don't think I want to go, I don't think I want to go. And they're like, just get on the ship. <laughs> <laughs> and I got on the ship and then I was still talking away on the phone and freaking out when the horn blew and we'd pulled away. And I thought, right, just hang out for a bit and then go to bed. So I went to sleep. I woke up in the morning and looked out of my porthole and there was nothing but the Southern Ocean. And that's when I had that moment. I was like, I am at sea and there's no going back now and it's going to be really great. So I had this... I was really proud of myself that I'd got through that initial fear and made it to the next morning, to that moment. <laughs> Thanks for the question. I'm really proud of you too. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. <laughs> um, I wondered, I, I read a couple of years ago Jesse Blackadder's book, Chasing the Light. Yes. Uh, the book about, for people that don't know it, about um, uh, the first uh, women that were on a ship to Antarctica. Yes. And uh, Norwegian women. And uh, I'm sure you know the book. It's a great book. <laughs> oh, it's a fantastic read. Mm. It's a novel, but it's based on the, the, the scant information that she could find about these women. And, uh, of course, one of the m most interesting things about that book was that they were women who were very intrepid. They were determined to go, but no one would have them on the boats. And That's right. no women were allowed to, uh, to to go on these boats, but they, they managed this, et cetera, which was fabulous. And so it made me think about, uh, in your writing of this book, both your own trip to Antarctica and in the actual writing of the book, um, the, the role of women now and how you thought about that and how you saw that uh, in, yeah, in that. It's so interesting because on Nella Dan, um, all of the crew were men in the 80s. Um, half of the expeditioners started to become women in the later 80s. But now on the ship, half of the crew are women. Yeah. 
the second mate was a woman um some of the hardest jobs in the engine room were women and it, i was so proud and amazed but it was nothing to them they'd been doing that they've been lucky enough to grow up in a time where that's they're encouraged and allowed to do those jobs and they thrive at it and it i think as far as the um closeness and the um talking about emotions and dealing with things like that on the ship the female presence really helps with that dancing for example um i know when they have a base that's all male for the winter no one dances they have a whole nightclub set up down on the bases and no one does but if they just have one woman everybody dances it's like it's you know and it really that really helps i mean when you're stuck with just 20 people for a winter in the dark in antarctica you need to do things like dance and so it does help and it's really changed shipping and it's fantastic and i feel really proud to have grown up in a time thanks to those women who were the trailblazers that now we're able to do any of those jobs and was there really no alcohol for the whole time? There really was no alcohol, except for on the base of Antarctica, there is home brew, so everybody's very desperate to get across to the base. <laughs> thank you so much. You've been the icing on the cake of a brilliant week. Oh, thank you. And it's been a delight listening to you quietly telling your story. Um, I too share a love of being on the ocean, but where are you going next with water? Because water seems to be a theme for it you. It does. Oh, look, I would do anything to go back to sea. And actually, um, I'm thinking of trying to work at sea. So I'm looking at getting my safety and first aid and the first ticket, that 10-day ticket at Maritime College. Um, and if Aurora Australis offered me a job as a steward, I would take it. Um, absolutely. So apart from that, I really am hopeful of um, doing some sailing in the Arctic, but on a tall ship. Wow. So that's something I'm working on um, and getting that experience of a real sailing ship. Um, so fingers crossed, but I'm definitely going back to sea. <laughs> I can't wait to read it. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>